With that said, I'd like to introduce our speakers this afternoon. Brian Detman is a managing director in the Mergers and Acquisitions Group at Trua Securities. He has over 25 years of experience advising, operating, and investing in middle market and family owned companies. We also have Eric Holmes. Eric is the managing director for the Business Transition Advisory Group, guiding business owners through the different elements of the transition planning process with a focus on their goals and objectives. He works with business owners from pre through post transition planning while collaborating with experts to create a transition strategy and plan for the future. So Brian, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you for you to kick us off. Sure, thanks Kevin. Um, and I thought what we would do is just start with a little bit and we can flip to the next slide. Um, is a, just a little quick overview on, on the middle market kind of M&A uh, world today. Um, and then I'll uh, pass it on to Eric on, for some comments on some, some planning aspects. So we, when we kind of think about things, we, we use this sort of you know, stoplight uh, 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 system to kind of think about how we think about different parts of the market and the M&A market. So green, green yellow, red. Um, and as you can, if there's a quick glance at this, you've got kind of all the major factors green, and I might argue in some cases flashing green. Um, uh, no surprise, and, and most of you have probably heard this, the merger and acquisition market um, has been incredibly robust um, in 21. Um, there's lots of reasons for that. Um, some of it is uh, there was some pent up demand from 2020 uh, when COVID was at its height um, and probably delayed some things into this year. And then we, we saw a lot of tax uncertainty and, and some other factors maybe perhaps accelerate some deals that, that might have uh, been completed in 22 and 23 and beyond that probably got pulled into 21. Um, so it has been um, just sort of broadly speaking, uh, the, the volumes, the valuations um, are probably in many sectors have already exceeded prior year, entire years, and we're, we're only, you know, bar barely into October. Um, and, and, and our fourth quarter in the M&A world tends to be heavy anyway, uh, and it will continue to be heavy. Um, but in terms of some of just general data points we look at, you know, these are ranged from subjective to objective, but we kind of use this to kind of guide our thinking. Um, business confidence, that's a mixture of surveys that we either subscribe to or we have done ourselves. As you kind of see there, if you kind of glance through these things, it, the vast majority of investors have expected a strong economy. I think we've seen that. Um, CEOs expected revenues to be up materially, profits to be up materially. And, and, and the last data point, you know, two thirds of folks are basically saying, we're gonna expand our workforce. Interesting to know <clears throat> whether they're able to actually do that or not, given the availability of, of folks to work. That's been a constant uh, problem throughout the, uh, I'll call it the whole uh, skill level from entry level folks um, at minimum wage all the way up through, you know, more skilled labor and, and professionals, frankly. Um, but, but confidence clearly is at a, at a flashing green uh, positive. Um, as I hinted at earlier, valuations, not only volume of transactions, but, but uh, valuations both in the public markets uh, and also in the, in the private markets um, have been strong. I think we saw a lot of momentum coming into the year and we're seeing a lot of folks trying to get stuff done here before the end of the year. Um, that's aided and, and typically goes hand in hand with the next two columns, which would really be liquidity and, and, and the availability of financing uh, capital. Um, liquidity is strong. Private equity is, is sitting on a trillion dollars of dry powder, uh, which can normally be levered you know, one or two times that. Uh, Fortune 500 companies have record amounts of cash and undrawn lines of credit. Um, and, and the general sort of, um, I'll call it uh, monetary policy has, has, has been accommodative to transactions. Um, and, and kind of that kind of bleeds into the financing side. Uh, banks, non-bank institutions have, have been you know, very willing to lend and lend at not only low rates, but also at probably higher leverage uh, uh, ratios. And as you move into kind of bigger companies, you know, we've seen the return of covenant light deals, um, which uh, we hadn't seen in a while. Um, 
the equity capital markets have been strong, a little choppy in the last few days here, uh, but generally um, have been phenomenally strong. Um, and then no surprise, if you think about industries consolidating that too, right? There, there's a lot of um, uh, folks, whether that's from just deploying capital, if you're more of a financial investor, um, or larger strategics, be those public or private, looking for growth. And as, as growth by organic means becomes more and more challenging and you want to hit your numbers, it kind of leaves you with one option if you really want to grow, and that's that's inorganic or or by buying either com competitors or forward or backward integrating, and and so um, again very very robust both in terms of volume and valuations. Uh, if we can flip to the next slide, um, and there's a lot of stuff here. I, I think that what I would have you focus on is the, the uh, kind of the top chart. If, if you see, you know, up and to the right and, and most of our charts um, that we would use typically would, would look like that, especially given the market we're in, um, both again, in terms of dollars and in, in deals. If you look at the kind of bar chart in the center left, that's, you know, capital raised. Um, you can see that that's almost uh, not quite doubled every year for the last uh, a couple of years. Um, and, and, uh, and the only aberration here, and I don't have a good answer for it, is, is transaction multiples. Um, you see on the far right, I would have expected that to be you know, a double digit number. Um, I suspect some of that is some noise um, from COVID adjustments on companies. Um, but, but you see very, and again, this is a broad aggregate average. So um, it, it's, it's uh, it, it, but what it does show is that the, 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 Historically, if you go, went back further than this, you know that's a pretty material uptick for the same companies today versus ten or even twenty years ago. Um, again, dry powder, lots of liquidity, um, and and Eric's going to talk a little bit about this too. Is is really and uh, some of this is driven, we believe, by an aging uh, a baby boomer population, which still own and control a disproportionate amount of the privately owned companies uh, in in the U.S. anyway. Um, next, next slide. Um, Eric, I'm gonna let Eric chat a little bit about this, but you'll see that his comments will dovetail into some of this activity that's been driven this year too. Awesome. All right, um, good. So I, I, let me touch on a little bit of uh, the potential tax legislative changes. Um, um, as, you, as Brian just described in his comments that the market is green and virtually all indicators, right? So the time to maximize the enterprise value is, is pretty much now, right? Uh, but the, the problem with business owners um, and, and this M&A market is that they're focused on sort of the, the enterprise value, maximizing the enterprise value, less focused on maximizing the, the net take-home pay, right? The net proceeds. And one of the biggest indicators in uh, the net proceeds is taxes, which there's a lot of, you know, sort of proposed legislative changes um, around taxes, not only on the income tax side, but also on the estate tax side um, in, in um, 2021 and, and beyond. So, so I'll, let me dive into a few of these specific to business owners um, dealing with the transaction and, and as well as continuing to run on uh, and operate the business. So uh, the first um, indicator is sort of the, the top tax bracket increase from 37% to 39.6%, sort of um, um, what the pre-TCJA legislative changes were that will, you know, proposed kick back in January 1, 2022. Uh, the qualified business income deduction um, is being limited to businesses that have um, less than 400,000 in um, income, uh, which is a huge shift. Previously, it was available to all non uh, specified service trader businesses that um, you can take the 20% deduction. It was sort of in place of uh, the 199 um, deduction that you used to get for uh, you know manufacturing. That was a sort of 9% uh, 
uh, deduction that you were able to take advantage of uh, previously. Uh, then the, also you have the net investment income tax application, uh, which essentially is applying to um, businesses that are active. So you think about materially, pay, materially participating in a business, running a business, you weren't subject to the net investment income tax. If it was a flow through entity, um, uh, the proposed change is to allow uh, for the net investment income tax to kick in um, if you have um, income, business income in excess of 400,000, uh, which is which is a huge shift, and that's 3.8 percent. Um, it's uh, one one item to note is it's it's uh, only on the income that's not already subject to self-employment tax, which happens to be you know essentially the same 3.8 percent. Uh, and then the new kicker that, that kicked in was this new 3% surcharge of, on modified adjusted gross income in excess of $5, $5 million. Um, on the corporate tax side, so this is, you know, you think about your C-corporate um, business owner or business entities, um, they they're moved, they, um, suggested a move from flat tax rate to a graduate tax rate, um, increasing the top tax bracket to uh, 26.5% um, uh, come January 1 um, in that proposal. Uh, if, if I look at the graduate rate structure, um, I think it's 18% for uh, income less than 400,000, um, and then 21% uh, for income in between 400,000 and 5 million, uh, and then the 26.5% for um, those in excess of that. Um, so for transactions, the big the big one was the capital gain tax rate uh, increased uh, from 20% to 25%. Now, um, uh, previously back in April, uh, President Biden uh, suggested that the cap top tax uh, capital gain rate would be um, adjusted to the same as the highest uh, regular tax rate for ordinary income of 37% in 2021. 39.6% in 2022. Uh, however, they, they shifted that from 20 to 25%. Um, and uh, the effective date for this is um, on the uh, date of introduction, which was September 13th of 2021. For transactions that have not been, uh, um, you know, uh, sort of uh, completed, the, the liquidity may not have to transfer, but the um, you know signing of the purchase agreement was before September 13th, then you are allowed an exception to continue to maintain the 20% capital gain rate, um, but uh, even if the proceeds came after that. So that, that was one sort of uh, exception that was provided in there, uh, but nonetheless, a, 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 a significant change in the uh, capital gain rate from 20 to 20. 25%. Um, and then on the potential estate tax changes, uh, we have uh, sort of the termination of the temporary increase in the unified credit. So uh, currently the exemption was 11.7 million, 23 and a half for a combined uh, marital um, exemption. Uh, that was already scheduled to uh, be re the um, repealed in 2025. Uh, at the end of 2025, um, this proposed legislation is accelerating that to the end of 2021. Um, and it will revert back to the previous exemption of 5 million uh, or 10 million combined marital plus uh, adjustments for uh, inflation. So um, somewhere around 6 million or 12 million uh, married, married uh, exemption. Um, Grants or trust limitations. These these were some 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 big ones as well. Um, the the grants or trust um, is treated as includable in uh, the grantor or decedent's estate, um, as, as assuming that they're deemed the owner of the trust um, at their death. Um, so that the you know normal uh, sale to defective grants or trust strategies grants that we would generally do for our clients sort of severely uh, uh, limited in how we can uh, continue to use those vehicles if this provision uh, was to remain in, in uh, whatever legislation that's passed. 
Um, and then the sale to the grantor trust would be treated as sort of a um, uh, the same as a third party transaction. So it would be treated as a arm's length transaction subject to capital gain rates um, upon the, the, that uh, sale to the uh, grantor trust. Uh, so there, there's a, a few a few significant items in uh, the most recent proposed changes uh, in tax legislation. Um, we'll keep our eyes and ears um, open and uh, waiting to see sort of how things progress um, in the House and the Senate and how things change. But this is all indication that something is going to change and it's, it's going to uh, be substantial to um, our business owners uh, and um, our, our you know, uh, I'll call high net worth individuals, um, uh, individuals making more than $400,000 uh, in, in income per year. Um, so the, the, one of the keys I would, I would mention here is um, we, we're sitting in October um, and there's a lot of planning opportunities um, to consider. Uh, the problem is time, right? So we don't know what's going to change. And, and by the time we do know it, it's going to be hard to implement any strategy. So we're, we're telling our business owner clients to um, start the planning process now. Think about sort of different strategies that they can implement today that they were going to do uh, in uh, 2022, sort of accelerating that um, if it makes sense. Um, and um, also just looking at the overall picture. Obviously, we don't want the tax tail to, to, to wag the dog, right? So we want to make sure that we're looking at all of the financial and non-financial reasons collectively and, and making those decisions um, in the best interest of our clients. So, um, so I'll skip to the next slide here. Okay, so why we do it? Um, Brian, I'll, I'll let you talk on this one. This is more of the voice of the client, what we're hearing from the client. Sure, thanks, Eric. Um, and and it, I kind of like the title of this because we do spend a ton of our time really listening to our clients. And ultimately, our goal, uh, Eric's goal, my goal is to help our clients make better decisions um, with, with what is certainly our business owner clients, a large portion of their net worth. Not uncommon you know, for their business to be 50 to 90 percent of their net worth. And so we spend a lot of time um, thinking about that and making, helping our clients make smart decisions. Um, what, what some interesting things that we hear, um, uh, this first quote, I think is sort of interesting. There appears to be a lot of interest, uh, from investors. Um, I, I, I get a lot of phone calls. Uh, should I sell to a strategic or a financial? Um, what's my business worth? One thing that we've seen, and this has continued to accelerate, you know, really over the last five and 10 years that the amount of, I'll call it outreach, telemarketing, smile and dial, whatever you want to call it, on behalf of buyers, or in some cases, pretend buyers, and that's an important concept here to distinguish. Um, in any case, there's a lot of outreach to business owners. Um, that combined with the fact that if you'll see that, you know, we still view the majority of private companies in the U.S. are owned by baby boomers. And I think if my math is right, the youngest baby boomer is somewhere in their late 50s. And, and, you know, the 20 years older than that. So probably at points in their careers where they're starting to think about, or if not already, planning on some kind of retirement or change in pace. Um, that increase in interest, it comes from a lot of uh, different data points. Um, we've seen financial buyers be, be more uh, organized and more deliberate about their outreach. Um, if you roll the clock back with private equity, it was definitely a little more um, clubby and relationship driven and, um, and, and less about really, you know, scouring the world to find, you know, great companies to buy. So we've seen, you know, buyers get smarter, more uh, organized, hiring business development people and, and people and even third parties to source investment opportunities. Um, that, that's, it's not new, but it's, it, that wasn't always that way. Um, the, the, and if you look at some of the data on the right, um, you've got business owners getting you know, an average of one inbound call you know, per week. My data would show that it's actually much higher than that. If I count emails, snail mail, uh, phone calls, um, you know, almost all of them have received some form of an offer. 
whether that was real or not, it's a whole separate conversation. Um, but it always comes down to, okay, as a business owner, what do I do and, and, and who do I believe? And, and one of the things I always remind folks is this is not the time to fall in love on the first date. Um, that there's someone calling out of the blue, uh, certainly if you don't know them. And even if you do, um, you need to understand kind of what they're, how much, why are they calling? Um, in, in, and if it's around a transition or sale of the business, you know, one, some general advice that, that we talk about is as if you're going to be a seller, make sure you keep yourself in the driver's seat and be a seller. And if you're not, Try and avoid getting tied up in the drama of folks, you know, uh, uh, recording and calling and whatnot and run your business. Um, there's to have a toe in each water is, is uh, or each bucket is probably a, a suboptimal outcome for you. Um, but we're seeing a lot of this. And this is probably the number one question we get from clients is how do I, what do I tell these people? Are they real? Are they fake? And, and the answer is probably some of both. Um, and, and then it leads to, and it's funny, I was just with a client yesterday and we spent a lot of time talking about that. And, and I said, well, what do you want to do? And a really successful, smart business person, he said, you know, I don't know. I've never really thought about what I want to do. I just know I'm getting a lot of inquiries and, and I'm not sure if my kids are interested. And I said, well, let's step back here and, and let's think about, and this is where Eric comes in. It seems like you've got the cart in front of the horse that let's take pause here with this, this asset that represents a big chunk of your net worth and let's make a smart decision and then act on that. Let's not be reactive to all of this uh, activity going on out there. Um, and, and, and that, um, I always like to remind people of that, that, that don't, don't get tied up in, in the drama of the moment, if you will. Um, and, and if you look at some of the other data points here on the right, you know, a third of owners, again, think about this. this these are owners that this is half or 90% of their net worth or something like that. Um, a third haven't taken any steps to really prepare themselves. Um, and, and part of that is, it's an interesting observation in that there are points where the business and the business owner become more and more difficult to separate, right? I think of this client yesterday I was with, and he said, listen, I, I don't know what else I would do. I've been spending my whole life and I am the face of this business. And, 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 and if this went away, um, and even if I sold it for a lot of money, I'm not sure what I would do the next day, right? And, and, and that sounds kind of um, strange, but, but the more you dive into business owners, there's lots of folks that you know, really have not stopped to take a breath to think about what's the smart way to move into this next phase and whether this next phase is six months or six years or, or multiple decades, if it's going to stay in the family, you know, take the time to be smart about, about planning it. And, and, you know, the number one feedback we get from most of our clients who have sold, we said, what would you do differently? Um, it's pretty much the majority say, I wish I would have started thinking about and planning this earlier. Um, and I think we've, the average is kind of 1.3 years. And even with that as an average, the majority say, I wish I would have started even earlier. So those are some things that we hear about. Um, there's another thing about here, transition to employees. Is, is that a viable option? Um, it always can be. And obviously people talk about ESOPs and ESOPs can, can be a really great tool, um, but an ESOP is not for every situation, right? There are some great tax benefits that come with that, um, but there are some uh, challenges and some hoops to jump through um, in terms of, 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 of you're really bringing on the Department of Labor really as, as, a, as a partner, right? Because you're now would be owned by a retirement plan, which is, is regulated by ERISA. So, um, and there's a whole bunch of uh, not public company scrutiny, but there's definitely third party fiduciary scrutiny you need to be mindful of. Um, and, and some folks are, are not comfortable with that despite the tax benefits from that. So I always remind folks that employee transition can be a great option. ESOP is a great tool and can be a great tool, um, but it doesn't have a monopoly or an exclusive on a sale to employees either. You can sell to a third party or, or an employee um, outside of the ESOP structure too, um, which may or may not be right for you. Um, and, and a lot of this, if you've kind of noticed, I like to kind of get people thinking about 
you know, more options versus fewer and be prepared that there's kind of one takeaway here um, that I would sort of reiterate. Um, Eric, you, you know, yeah. this is really more in your area. You have any thoughts there? Yeah. Yeah, no, no, several thoughts. I mean, I, and I, I think you're, you're, you're spot on too with, you know, the fact that, you know, business owners aren't, aren't planning early enough and, and they need to, I can tell you sort of why, what my understanding of why, you know, they're not focused on the personal planning is because when you're, 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 you know, running the business, you're so focused on, you know, the operations of the business, growing the business, making the business successful when you're talking about a uh, transaction or a transition from that business with a transaction, um, it's easy to get to sort of the, the business prep side, right? You know, sort of how do I adjust my EBITDA? What are some of the personal things I'm doing in the business that can be wiped out so I can improve my, my EBITDA to gra- gather a higher multiple? It's very, very challenging to go from, you know, running the business to business prep to the personal prep because it's not, it's not as quantifiable. The personal prep, sort of the quantifiable piece generally happen after the transaction or even in some cases after you pass away, right, as a, as a business owner. So um, it's harder for them to move their minds to that. Um, but that's that's why they created our, our role and why it, um, we're, we're a part of the team is so that we can uh, help business owners, you know, think about all of this just as a part of their business strategy. And if I go to the next slide here, sort of, this is sort of the, the, the owner considerations. Um, and I like to put this in, in sort of a, you know, um, uh, five keys to a successful transition. Um, so the, the first uh, key that we always uh, think about is, and we, we label this begin with the end in mind, right? So it's uh, what's important to you? What do you want to accomplish? You know, sort of what, what does life look like after um, an exit from your business or a transition from your business, not only for yourself, but for your family, your, your team, your community, um, and, and sort of let's build that out so that we can do our planning aligned with those goals and objectives. Um, you know, most of the business owners I, I work with, um, they're spending 40, 50, 60, sometimes 80 hours a week in the business. Um, and when you just turn that off, you know, in, in a, you know, after a transaction, spending that 40, 50, 60, 80 hours in the business or outside of the business, you got to have something fulfilling to, to fulfill that time, right? Something that you're, you're passionate about. I always use the analogy of, you know, you don't, you don't get to the top of Mount getting to the top of Mount Everest isn't the end of the climb, right? Cause you still got to get back down if you want to survive. So, you know, when you sell the transaction, that's more, you're at the top, you know, and then everything, you know, coming down is sort of helping you to, you know, maintain a quality lifestyle so you can live to tell the story, right? So, so that, that's sort of the, the first, um, you know, sort of key to a successful transition is begin with the end of mind. The second, obviously, is you, you need time. So you want to prepare in advance. We like to tell our clients 1.3 years is not enough. So think about two to three years. You know, if you can do more than that, that's awesome, right? But two to three years is sort of the the benchmark. Um, uh, The third third piece is sort of, um, uh, I like to call build a team, uh, a a transition team. Um, Running the business is the business owner's thing. They're great at it, right? But they're not necessarily good at transactions or, or what transition is. So they need to bring in trusted advisors that can help them sort of navigate this process and um, align together so that the synergies of that group can provide the best interest for the client. Um, and then the fourth piece is the alignment of the business and the personal. So oftentimes there are um, conversations that go on that are specific to the business. And then you have conversations that go on that's specific to the personal, whether it's income tax, estate, you know, health, et cetera. Sometimes they, they don't get to come together in time so that you, you understand the, the decisions that's made on the business and how it impacts you personally. And we want that alignment so that, that our, our owners understand, hey, I made this decision. 
this is what it means to the business, but this is what it means to me personally. Am I okay with that? Um, and then the, the, the fifth sort of key is, um, I, I call this prepare in the green zone, but uh, be ready in the red zone. So 50% of all businesses transition uh, for reasons outside of their control, whether it's death, disability, you know, some sort of disagreement, uh, you get burned out, um, you know, or, or there's a divorce, right? Um, that, that transaction is going to happen in any of those circumstances. Um, so you have to be prepared and protect the value that you created. So when that happens, everyone is sort of on the same page of what, you, what your wishes are in the event you're not able to make them or, you know, sort of your hands are tied um, in that respective process. So th those are sort of the, the keys to the trans trans transition that will help us to influence the transaction on behalf of, of the business owner. Um, one other thing, too, I was going to mention when I um, – talk about building a team, you know, there's, there's several players involved in that. You know, you think about investment banker, M&A attorney, um, you think about your management team, your, your family, um, your, your CPA, your legal counsel. Uh, but wealth is oftentimes forgotten in that transaction. Um, so I, I encourage business owners to think about their wealth team and bring them under the tent before the transaction happens. Because 90, oftentimes 90%, well, seven, between 70 and 90% of your net worth is tied into the business. And when you harvest that wealth, not having a relationship with a wealth advisor during that process or a, um, um, an asset manager during that process oftentimes creates a little bit of um, a, a catch up period where they're not able to put the dollars to work at, in the best interest for you based on your goals and objectives because they're still trying to learn and get caught up to speed. So you want to make sure all of that's integrated and make for, make for a smooth transaction um, and, and or transition uh, from the business. So um, with that, I'll, I'll, Brian, I'll, any, anything to add on that piece? No, I think you summed it up well. Hey, gentlemen, we have uh, a few questions in the chat here. Uh, the good. first All one. All right, good. Uh, look at that, good transition. Are you uh, are you seeing any specific trends in how business owners are exiting, and what Noel means more towards is are they slanting more towards sales to PE or financial entities, or more towards employee sales, etc. Um, I'll take that. I, I don't think I don't think there are any trends. I think you know there are kind of four buckets of buyers, right? If I kind of define them broadly, you have financial buyers, you have strategic buyers, you have financial sponsor back strategics, which are sort of a hybrid of those two. And then I would say employees or friends and family. Um, I don't, we have, we've seen more interest in ESOP certainly because of tax uncertainty and some of the tax potential tax benefits. So we've seen more interest. I don't think we've seen any more ESOP deals actually get done because of it yet. Um, that might, when we get new data here towards the end of the year, that may change. Um, historically, it was always believed that strategics could pay more than a financial buyer because they would be able to um, uh, enjoy more synergies as uh, I think that is sometimes true, but less um, less a fact and more opinion today than what it was maybe five or 10 years ago. We've seen private equity firms who, uh, if they have a, a business plan to consolidate and buy multiple firms in a, in a particular industry or sector, that they have been willing to compete in, 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 uh, and pay full and fair value in some cases even exceeding what a strategic would buy, and in some cases actually being able to close more quickly, um, which is a whole separate non-economic consideration. So anyway, that's kind of a long answer to um, don't have any trends that would point one over the other um, uh, that, that are discernible. Yep. Hey, Brian, uh, and that, yeah, I was thinking too, um, just on the ESOP question, um, you know, there's when you think about it, there's 7 million closely held businesses uh, in the U.S., but there's only 7,000 ESOPs, right? So, so it's, it's 
to me, that tells me that it's a specific sort of strategy for a, a smaller group of uh, companies um, that, that needs to be, you know, sort of taken in consideration with the planning. I find myself talking about ESOP quite often with business owners. Um, and, you know, we, we go down the, you know, feasibility and then we get to a, a level where they're saying, you know, essentially this is way too complex for what we're trying to accomplish. Maybe this isn't the best path. Right. Yep. Um, so, so that, that, that is a, is a very popular conversation um, and a path to sort of go down. Um, and I'm not saying, suggesting that it's not the best, uh, for a particular business owner, I'm just saying that it's it's limited to to um, uh, a few business owners versus uh, um, you know a wide population. Right, right, and yeah. and again, given some of the benefits, I'm going to use two negatives here. You can't afford not to explore it, um, but right. it is the degree of difficulty is definitely higher. So you you really have to. Yeah make sure that it is, it achieves your goals. Um, that's what I would say yeah. on that. So. Yeah, no, nope, fair. Oh, and, and since I think we got some time to, um, some other trends too, that I'm thinking about just in terms of the, the, the transaction and sort of getting from, you know, the enterprise value to net proceeds. Uh, we're seeing a lot of sort of asset sale transactions versus stock sale transactions, um, uh, which has a, a change in sort of, you know, the, the way um, the tax is structured, whether it's ordinary income or uh, capital gains. Um, and, and then we're, we're also seeing um, some rollover equity opportunities for uh, specific industries, you know, think about medical practices, um, you know, service businesses uh, of that nature, insurance companies uh, as well. So, very good. Very good. Thank you, guys. Uh, next question. Should you pay off as much debt as possible before funding a buyer, or will the valuation of the business take debt into account? Um, that, that's a good question. Um, uh, and, and from a purely academic sense, uh, the answer is it's really irrelevant, right? The, the buyer will generally look at the cash flow of the business before interest expense, which takes into account capital structure, and come up with some valuation on the firm. And if it has debt, that will be subtracted from the value to arrive at what they would pay the shareholders. So if you had a lot of debt, the, the gross number would be the same theoretically, and the, the debt would either be paid off and then the rest to the shareholders, or if there were no debt, it all go to the shareholders. So the short answer is, doesn't matter. Um, the more complicated answer is, um, the more flexibility you have, the, the, you know, is all is always good, right? So if your debt is manageable, right, that's fine. It's irrelevant. If you have a lot of debt and it's starting to influence your viability and your, your decision-making, then I'd say, well, you know, you've got to, you've got to play the long game, right? You can't game the system um, that will eventually catch up with you and work against you. All right, Eric, anything to add yeah. to that? Um, no, that, that sums it up. The, the one thing I would, I would say, though, is, you know, um, debt is fairly cheap today, right? So leveraging debt is not necessarily a, a bad idea, given the, the low-rate environment. Um, we have seen uh, clients who are um, selling their business and, they started the process maybe later in the year where they're not going to be able to close in 2021. Consider doing, you know, a dividend recap or some sort of debt structure where they can uh, sort of accelerate um, a distribution in 2021 to take advantage of uh, the current, you know, tax structure. Um, so that when they sell the business in the future, they're going to net out a lower dollar amount, but pay less taxes because they're letting out a lower, a, a lower dollar amount. So sort of a rate arbitrage strategy because of rates being low. Um, in addition, we're seeing sort of, you know, after the liquidity event, uh, business owners are leveraging their 
um, investment, marketable securities, uh, line of credit to pay their tax liability. Um, be, again, because rates are low, they're going to grow those dollars substantially higher um, than you know the interest rate on on that borrowed debt. So, so I, I don't think about paying off debt unless it keeps you up at night, right? If it's a peace of mind thing, then pay off the debt, right? But if if you're comfortable with a little leverage, then now may be a time to consider, you know, sort of the, some of the lower rate options. All right, very good. Thank you. Um, last question I have in the chat is, is it more appealing to a buyer if the business is to have access to capital, even low interest debt? Um, I, I'll take that. And um, I think it's, it, the short answer is that it's probably irrelevant. Most most transactions, the buyer's not going to assume the debt anyway. They're going to finance it on, on their own balance sheet and their own cost of borrowing and cost of capital. So the, 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 even if you have a great you know, bank deal, um, it's probably going to get paid off um, and, 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 the, and the new combined company and the new owner will finance it as they see fit. All right. Very good. That's all we have in the chat. If anyone else has any questions, feel f Oh, we just had another one come in. Uh, how far into the future should you show projections to the buyer? Um, you know, at the end of the day, that's a decision that you and your M&A advisor will want to make together. Um, most buyers will ask for at least three years, although they might ask for five, but, um, you know, ultimately, when you do want to sell, um, I'll answer a different question, but you'll get the answer, I think, for your question. It kind of gets back to, if you're talking to a buyer, you should be running a process, hiring an, uh, an M&A advisor to run a process, and you're in the driver's seat about what information you want to show. If you're responding to an inquiry on a one-off bilateral conversation with a buyer, I, my view is you're already going down a suboptimal path because you, you're not taking advantage of having multiple buyers compete in the same time frame with the same information. So you've already handed the uh, driver's seat over to the buyer at that point. Um, and, and you know what would we typically do when we're representing a seller? Um, it would be three to five years depending on the nature of the business. Um, for a lot of businesses, Five years is a really long time. It's it's hard to put a lot of credibility on something five years out. Um, three is a, a little more realistic. Yeah, and right, I, I mean that's a good point, um, Brian. Yeah. I, I think um, just thinking about you know when I when I describe building a team, you know having someone represent you um, for is arguably the largest transaction of your life is. is critical, right? So you, you want to make sure you have the talent on the field when when you're going through that process. Um, because I, I, I'm confident to say that that buyer is going to have a lot more experience than, than you uh, in deals. So you want to make sure you have um, your investment banker um, or your M&A attorney, you know, side by side with you working through um, that transaction. So I, I think that's, that's, that's very key. Um, I, I would, I, the benefit is going to far out, uh, far succeed the cost in, in that scenario. All right. I've seen that's a couple over. of, uh, of, uh, transactions on the sell side being a CFO. And I I've seen a lot of, uh, business owners leave money on the table because even if they do the right thing and hire an advisor, this or that, what they haven't done is they haven't maintained their financial records. They don't have the history. They want to sell by such and such a date and they haven't got their act together. And I wonder if you have any experience where you're thinking, geez, if they had just started a year earlier or two years earlier prepping and you've actually seen value left on the table because they've made that mistake and, and had to take a hit or a discount from a buyer. You, you well, you, you're 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 sort of giving our talk here, right? It, and and we always we 
we talk about be prepared, right? And, 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 and it goes above and beyond just planning. Um, you know, the, the, the old adage is a, a friend of mine who's an athlete, uh, a much better athlete than I have ever have been, says his view is train hard, fight easy. And, and his, his, his concept there is be really over-prepared when you do want to sell your business, right? All the planning things we've talked about for personal and business, but even just organizing all the information that ultimately you're going to show to buyers, you don't want to be building that airplane in flight, right? You want to have that all done, ticked and tied and, and all put in it with a nice pretty bow around it so that when it's time to disclose that to a buyer, you can do that with confidence and it's organized. You never want to get a question, you know, to the extent possible where it's like, oh my gosh, I, I, I have no idea, right? Um, and, and especially things that you should know, right? Or should be able to articulate. Yeah, and I, I tell uh, business owners, you know, when you're going through the due diligence process, you know, buckle up your seatbelt, right? Because it's going to be a little bit of a, a bumpy road because they're going to be, sort of, you know, pulling back the curtain, seeing, you know, all the decisions you made since the business was created, right? And so so it, it's a little bit of a challenge, right? Um, you know, because when you're running the business and trying to grow the business, you're not thinking about sort of, you know, um, early on at least, you know, some of those uh, um, document uh, preparedness sort of things that, that you should have kept better records of, so. We just had a question come in on the chat. What is your advice to sellers regarding seller financing for some or all of the purchase price? Um, Run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 there are very few things that are always or never. I, I can't imagine financing all of the purchase price because have you really sold your business, right? Um, that would be my, my quick response. Um, that being said, many private company transactions have some form of contingent payout, whether that's in partially uh, in the form of a note or an earnout or both. Um, you know, in the perfect world, you'd avoid any kind of continued uh, risk unless there's a good reason to have it. And, and usually seller financing or some kind of contingent payout is usually a way to bridge a valuation gap. The buyer thinks it's worth X and the seller thinks it's worth Y and they, they've come as far as they can go. And the difference, you know, you either walk away or you figure out a way to bridge it. And many times that's in the form of some kind of note or, or earn out. Um, the other time is when there's some big uncertainty, right? That is identifiable. Um, you know, maybe it's a large customer contract that's due for renewal or some environmental issue or whatnot. You know, there are times when it's a logical um, part of a deal structure when that, when the passage of time or some other events will be able to give better color on the true value, right? That, that might be a time. But I mean, the, the general old adage is if you don't get the cash at close, don't count on it. Um, and that's a little harsh, and, 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 but it's, um, it's, it's a safe way to think about things. Yeah, no, that, that's fair. And the only thing I'll add to that is it, it could be sort of a related party transaction. You know, so if you're thinking about, you know, parents, children, um, sort of transactions and seller financing may make sense in that um, strategy. Uh, even in, in employees, you know, sometimes there's relationships with employees where they treat them as if, you know, they're family, right? So you could see that. Um, so I spent, you know, um, 15 years in public accounting. And, and uh, when I was at Ernst & Young, uh, I had a client who sold his business to his management team. I think it, the sale was somewhere like seven, seven and a half million dollars, um, 100% seller finance note. Um, and, uh, he got about half of it back, um, by year, I think it was two, two and a half, almost three years. So, um, and that I left the firm, so I don't know what happened after that, but, um, um, uh, it, it seemed to be working out for him. Um, so, so I won't say that it's not all bad, but it is extremely risky. Yeah. 
The, the one form of seller financing that most people don't think about as seller financing is not selling the real estate and entering into a long-term lease. That, that really is a form of seller financing. Yeah. And depending on the, the personal preference and the tax situation and, and whether you'll want to, whether you like the credit of your tenant, that can be an attractive longer term financing uh, and for, for a buyer and seller. So that would be one, one I guess, I'll, I'll, a notable exception to one that is worth considering. Um, All right. Very the good. The answer That's is always, we... it depends. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just no saying, Kevin, that the answer is always, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> Beacon is the premier executive networking organization serving the Mid-Atlantic region. To learn more, go to beaconforlife.org.